We have joining us now Chris Ngodo, who is the Director General Office for Strategic Preparedness and Resilience. He joins us live from Abuja for more on this. Chris, good evening to you and thank you very much for your time. How significant is the refusal of Niger's school leaders to receive the proposed ECOWAS mission that went to the country? Um, the reasons they're given are security reasons. In the context of the ongoing public anger and revolt, uh, which came on the heels of the ECOWAS sanctions? Well, I think it signifies a hardening of their own stance, uh, probably um, in reciprocity, given the equally hardline stance that ECOWAS has taken. Um, so this is very much a regime that is digging in and uh, doesn't feel the need right at this moment to engage with an open hand, um, even engaging diplomatic overtures at, at, at this moment. Um, so I think that this is them just signifying that they are able to, um, to respond with a hardline stance of their own. Essentially, this is them signaling that they're able to um, also adopt a hardline stance given um, what has been the ECOWAS position over the past uh, week or so. Um, in your opinion, what impact might ECOWAS sanctions against Niger, you know, imposed after the coup have on the political and economic stability of West Africa? Well, it's, um, I mean, across, around the region, um, I wouldn't say that it would have much across the region. I think what we're likely to see is in a situation where these sanctions begin to bite, um, the, the most immediate impact would be on the perception of ECOWAS at Nigeria uh, by Francophone publics, by publics in the Francophone countries, and that perception will not be very complimentary. Um, at this moment, the sense um, in many Francophone African publics is that um, ECOWAS is acting more or less as a proxy um, for, for, for France and um, some other uh, Western interests. So um, I think that in the immediate, that is the kind of reaction that, that you will get. On Niger itself, um, it has to be said that Nigeria and Benin Republic, which are the two countries on its borders that are applying the sanctions, um, are the major trade routes. Don't forget that Niger is essentially landlocked. Um, so Nigeria and Benin Republic are its two um, most prominent routes for trade. Um, so the fact that these are the two countries implementing the sanctions um, mm -hmm. out of the other, out of its six regional neighbors um, is quite significant and that will have um, some impact on the population. Um, on the Nigerian side of the border, it will also have an impact on border communities, given um, the, the nature of the, of the cross-border economy between um, Nigerian communities and Nigerian communities. Mm. Uh, Chris, uh, what's the nature of the relationship between the coup leaders in Niger on one hand and Russia's Wagner group on the other hand, and how can this you know, relationship influence the country's political landscape? It's um, the relationship between these two entities is purely opportunistic. There is no um, deep, there's really no deep affinity between these groups. Um, what has happened is that um, you have opportunism on both sides. Um, there's an undercurrent of, um, of anti-French sentiment in a lot of Francophone countries. Uh, Niger is one of those countries. And the coup leaders took advantage of that. So they've continued to take advantage of that in their messaging um, after they seized power. Uh, now, that is the opportunism on their part. On the part of the Wagner group, it sees every opportunity um, induced by unconstitutional changes of government across West Africa as a market opportunity. So it sees now an opportunity to step in and present um, its menu of options for regime security, really, that is what it is. So they, they essentially are offering services to protect regimes in power. Um, so there is no deep affinity between these groups. What you're seeing is an opportunistic convergence. It's a marriage um, of convenience, uh, but it works for both of them. If uh, Niger can secure the services of the Wagner group, then it will consider that um, to be, you know, to, to be a gain for its own part. And obviously, for the Wagner group, it will be 
an expansion of its market share across um, a region that is it's already uh, quite prominently active in. Mm. Uh, interesting choice of words by you uh, to describe it as a market share. Um, uh, Anthony Blinken, you know, he gave an assessment of, of the Wagner Group and he says they're taking advantage of instability uh, in Niger. Now, how does this assessment by Anthony Blinken align with broader geopolitical interests in the region and what are the potential implications of this accession? I think I think the problem, you know, if we're going to get a bit down to the fundamentals, I think the challenge we're having is that in West Africa and the Sahel, uh, particularly, you have a situation where the security agenda is being shaped by external forces. Um, so yes, on the one hand, you have Wagner, the Wagner Group, uh, that has recently made inroads into countries like Mali, the Central African Republic. It's present in Libya as well. Um, there, there have been reports of it wanting to get into Burkina Faso. Um, certainly Niger is, or it is within its uh, crosshairs as well. Um, but on the other hand, let's not forget that you have had long-standing uh, French presence, French military presence. In fact, I would say um, that one of the fundamental issues, uh, one of the fundamental causes of discontent in Francophone West African countries is the presence of France, the overwhelming uh, presence of France in a military and economic sense in a way uh, that has, you know, that promotes the impression that these countries have yet to throw off the neo-colonial shackles of uh, their erstwhile colonial overlord. Um, so that is the, the, the challenge. I think that, yes, it is true that the Wagner Group is taking advantage of a situation. Um, this anti-French sentiment that exists has always existed, All right. uh, but it has recently approached critical mass. And the Wagner Group did not invent that. The Wagner Group is taking advantage okay. of that, right. uh, you know, to promote its own aim. All right. Yeah. Uh, uh, Chris Ngodo, Director General, Office of Strategic Preparedness and Resilience, uh, uh, thank you so much for joining us from Abuja to give us your expert analysis on this, as always. Thank you for having me.